that you can be anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. That you could knock down any barriers, and we believed it. And as young people, we participated as numbers in the march. And the transition for me took place, I guess, after I came back from the military. I got drafted, went to Vietnam, stayed there a year, came back, got elected SGA president at Alabama State, and the rest of it is history. I've been fighting ever since and will continue to fight for his right. Having said that, that means that for me, I made a fundamental decision that after we left our high school classrooms to participate under the leadership of people like Reverend Boone, after all that was over and I came back, got to be SGA president at Alabama State, got involved with the Alabama Democratic Conference, the Montgomery County Democratic Conference, and started working to get people elected to office, uh, getting people in various positions and things of that nature. But also I recognized as we went through that transition that some of us had to make another transition. That we planned marches during that time and I looked up and they were giving us all the protection that you needed. We marched all over, not the more you know, we marched down Dexter Avenue and we go to the Capitol and we complain about what they want. They give us all the protection, listen, and then we go home. I said, well, something has to change on that. We got to do something else. So we had to start getting in the boardrooms. We had to start trying to impact public policy. That's the reason that I decided to run for the county commission. I felt that uh, you could impact public policy, you could get into the boardrooms, and you could continue uh, what took place as it relates to the civil rights movement by helping the people that we represent and making sure that they're represented uh, not only in the county but statewide. Then I got elected to the legislature, uh, was fortunate enough to be chair of one of the major finance committees. I hope that my record will show that I tried to do everything I possibly could at that time uh, to help uh, in areas where people had not been able to re re receive their share of state funding. So that was a transition from the civil rights movement to saying that, look, you have to do something different now to maximize the things that have taken place in the civil rights movement. And as I said, we could go on and on all day on all of the issues and things that have taken place. Um, one of the things, one of the things that um, I think struck me was that in, in looking at the background of, of Barack, of President Barack Obama, and, and, and seeing how significant in his own life, in his own um, formation of his own identity, his experiences were in Chicago as a, as a, as a community organizer. And then, and, 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 and then it looks like his, and his efforts or his transition to electoral politics comes as, as a result of his experience with, with folks in Chicago, grassroots folks, and, and not being able to, to sort of effectuate change at that level. And so sort of seeking various elective offices, really with the core constituent in, 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 you know, made up of those individuals he worked with in Chicago. Is, is that your interpretation? And, and, and is, that, is that a parallel in your own experiences? I'd like either, either, any one of the panelists to speak to that. Chicago politics is the, is the model of productivity in the United States, period. You know, and when a person can navigate not just necessarily succeed, but survive the model, they're well qualified to run anything. You know, I tell people every day, you know, if it's, if it's not blessed in Chicago, it's not really going to ever leave from Marshall. Because the middle of the decisions, you know, that'll be big. Because that's the base. You know, all the way back, if you want to look at the effectiveness, we talk about uh, the Kennedy election. You know, Chicago was always, you know, one of those uh, cities, because most people, you know, they don't even refer to it as Chicago, Illinois, uh, they just said Chicago, that uh, if you didn't have the blessings uh, 
of Chicago through the uh, through history. You know, you, you know, your politics went too good. You know, if you were first, you know, you went from it. If if you went from there, basically, you had to be blessed from there. And I think that, like I said, with the president, I mean, he was well prepared before he got to Washington. He brought the people with him. You know, a lot of people say, what about Chicago? Well, who was supposed to bring your enemies? I mean, he kept some of them. He kept some of his enemies. But the people that was closest to him were the people that had been with him from day one. And it's just, you know, we had a situation here recently uh, with the auto loop. I had a guy, I think I might have mentioned to you, that uh, was talking about uh, that, that when we finally got the, uh, the well, we renamed the thing, we, we renamed it to the I-85 extension. And we had kind of a, some, uh, some materials and somebody saw the address about, you know, like Ray LaHood is the, the uh, Department of Transportation, you know, the uh, Director of the Federal Department of Transportation. And that's it was, it was, you know, it was addressed to him. Uh, and he just happened to be from Chicago, but the guy came in and just, in the last 30 days, he's talking about, well, I understand y'all use the, the Chicago connection to finally get the I-85 extension. I said, well, I don't know what I mean. Yeah, the, Ray Hood is from, LaHood is from, Chicago, but, you know, that's who else we're going to send the letter to? Yeah, but you no, no. But the point I'm making is that the president is not a near fight in dealing with the level of politics that, that he's having to encounter. He survived Chicago, uh, and the thing that put him there, which was God's will, uh, in my opinion, is strong enough to keep him there. Because as long as it's the will of God, and God don't put people, not only people in places, to fail. Thank you. Um, panelist, I, I'd like to, it, it, it's not coincidental that we had this type of um, program at this juncture in time. It's an important juncture in time. And we wanted our public to reflect on the, the role that, that the civil rights movement played in, in setting the stage for the modern political uh, atmosphere. And that this is not, you know, I'm a historian, but this is not really distant history. The individuals who are major players are sitting amongst you and on this path. Um, I, I, before, before we end the program, I'd like to extend an invitation to our resident political scientist, and I think he's a political scientist by training, um, our president, Dr. Silver, to see if he has any comments. Dr. Rock, before you get to the president, may I make a statement? Sure. Uh, yeah. Can I your mic? Yes. Please forgive me, but I've been sitting here listening to all of this going on, and I have a thing in my heart I want to share with you, is that uh, the, the, the the, the growing of Montgomery, Alabama and its surrounding areas as a result of Alabama State University. The crux of it is Mayor Strange's word dream. And dream comes from modern. And all of this that they are getting, they're getting on the back of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And I feel that there should be some systematic or some delicate place that the Montgomery Improvement Association should be, that when those people come in to see what's going on, that the Montgomery Improvement Association, which is the backbone to E.D. Nixon and King, that it should be here. But it is not there. So they're riding on the back of the dream, and the dream is not there. You understand what I'm saying? Do you hear me I'm saying, John? First of all, I'd like to say thank you to each of you who has come this morning and to our panelists. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> to Dr. Franklin and your staff, you know you and I had a long discussion 
about the importance of this center in providing and, and preserving the legacy of the civil rights movement and the culture of African American people. Certainly, I will say very publicly that one of the uh, enticements for me to say yes to come to Alabama State University was its long-standing relationship in the movement. And I do think that it is our responsibility to begin to systematically <clears throat> preserve uh, that legacy and to have an opportunity to be in the midst of individuals uh, that actually were part of the movement is really, really humbling. As I said to the television station earlier, that it's an appreciative model, but it's also very humbling. And when we put this into a context, when, we, when I say put this into a context, meaning what's going to happen uh, in a few weeks, the, the national election. And when I hear people talk about, well, I don't know if I'm going to vote this year because I'm upset about this, I'm upset about this. It really galls me because when you think about the struggles of the individuals at this table and, and those who are in the audience and those who have died for the right to vote, for us to even think about not voting is an abomination before God and man so far as I'm concerned. We, we, we go all the way back to uh, the civil rights cases of 1883, for an example, and, and how systematically uh, we were denied the right for public accommodations, and we go back until, what, 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment. That's when we, we got the right to vote, so to speak. And then for the ladies in this audience, in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed with giving right, uh, women the right to vote and the infamous Civil Rights Act. But yet and still today, in, in 2012, there are, there are people in positions who are now actively trying to curtail that right to vote with various nuances of identification or changing the polling places and not letting folk know about this. So as, uh, as was said on the panel, the, the struggle is not over. The struggle is not over. And forever and a day we have been debating the issue of should we have stayed activists or should we become politicians. And, and my position has always been that you have to get in where you fit in. So there you're going to need the activists, but you're also going to need the politicians because what the electoral politics is what I'm saying. Because what we are simply talking about really are spheres of influence. And wherever decisions are made, we need to be there. So if it's in the halls of Congress, we need to be there. If it's in the judiciary, we need to be there. And finally, in the executive branch as president of the United States, we are there. It doesn't in any way undermine or lessen the need for the community activists. We still need that. And what we also need is that when we do ascend to levels of authority, whether it's the president of Alabama State or the president of the local city council, that we should not forget that we're standing on the shoulders of other folk. This is not our office. This is still the people's office. And so therefore, we should act accordingly. I was so pleased, so pleased, with the number of our students who've been involved in the Get Out the Vote campaign. Yes. And what we have to do is <coughs> make sure that going forward, that our students take an active role. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm, I'm, people who have come to know me know that I speak my mind, okay? Now, as much as I've enjoyed this panel today, there's something missing here. And it's the students. It's the students. Because in many cases, sometimes it's not about whether or not they want to come or not, it's that they need to come and hear this. So my pledge is if we do this again, and we will, that we're going to have it in another place. We might start here with a little something, but we're going to get it bigger where we can actually have the students to come in and listen to the living legends. You know, they'll walk by, by Mr. McClanahan is on campus all the time, and Mr. Knight works here, 
Reverend Boone's in the community, they can walk by these individuals and not even know Amen. the struggles that they had so these students can actually attend here. And to me, we need to fix that. Part of that's going to be on me as president of the institution. Part of it's going to be on Dr. Franklin as president of, uh, as, uh, as the chair of this, this, this center. But what I'm simply saying is, lest we forget, then we'll fall into the same trappings. It's not a coincidence that as long as Dr. King was talking about civil rights, that folk kind of tolerated the movement. But when he began to expand this into economic rights, then they said he was dangerous. Am I right, Reverend Bowen? Because folk understand that it's not about just the pie. It's about who's at the table to cut the slice of the pie. And what he was simply saying is that we too are Americans. And we too should have our piece of the economic pie. And it's not just the individuals who are at this level, but it's also about the least among us. It wasn't a coincidence that on the eve of his death, he was with the sanitation workers. Because what he was trying to do was send a message to all of America that no matter who you are, where you came from, you still have and should have the rights of every citizen in this country. So I'm very afraid that we have become comfortably complacent and that we are selective in terms of how we extend our influences and our resources if it's not going to be a reverberation back against us. We're still concerned in many cases about wanting the position as opposed to positioning the people to have their own rights. So I take my hats off to the center. I take my hats off to the panelists. And my pledge to you is that should we do this again, not only are we going to have those of you who were particip participants, those of you who've been the caretakers of the experience, but we're going to get these young folk in here because they need to hear this. I'm not saying this just because you all are here. Because I came and met with Dr. Franklin and I said my vision is that every student who comes to Alabama State University will have to come to this center. That even as we are bringing them on recruitment trips, that part of the stop will be here. And then once they get here through intentional programming through freshman year experience or through the various departments, that they would have to come by here. And that's my pledge to everybody in this room, that we're going to be intentional about the growth and development of this center. Having said this to Dr. Franklin, but I met with some folk out of Washington last year, last week, when I was in New Orleans, uh, in the in Department of Interior and in the White House initiatives on HBCUs. And I have already begun to petition them to say, you got to come here and look at what we're doing, and you got to go back and tell folk that you got to finance the expansion of what we're doing. And so, I'm asking any of you in here that have influence, whether real or perceived, that we have to begin to take this message to the people, to the elected officials, and make sure that this center, the vision for this center, is actually realized. So again, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for your time. Thank you for each of you in the audience for your time. And I want you to know that each of us has a responsibility to make sure that everybody we know, everybody we know, go to the polls and vote come election day. If there's anybody in your family, anybody in your spheres of influence, you need to question them. Call them out. Have you voted early? If not, what time are you going to vote on election day? Let me know when you come back after you cast your vote because there are too many critical issues for us to sit on the sidelines and be, be observers. There are too many people in this city who pay the price for us to sit on the sidelines to be observers. There are too many people who have died for our right to vote, for us to be sitting on the sidelines to be observers. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for your time. We appreciate you very much.
Thank you for your attendance. And um, I, I just want to make one announcement that um, on the 18th of November, the library will, will have its formal opening. And so there's a number of venues that I think you're going to enjoy. We, we, we memorialized um, the Civil Rights Movement and, and Evie Nixon in two exhibit spaces. And we, we focused on the role that um, Alabama State students, staff, and faculty and alumni played in the modern civil rights movement in, in these exhibits. But the, 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 the library is a wonderful facility. Take advantage of your opportunity to see that facility um, on the 18th of um, November. <laughs> yes, and we, last week we installed um, another in our series of murals outside. Please take a, a look at these murals at your, at your convenience. They are a wonderful representation of the experience of, of persons of African descent in America throughout um, the duration of this nation's history. It's, it's a wonderful um, treasure that we have here at the university. It's free and open to the public. You can go out and peruse it. Um, please look at our murals. Right now, we're going to have a repass in the, in the next room over. Please join us for refreshments, and you can interact with our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.